Greetings everyone, this is Mr. Mullen. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how you can find the concentration of ions in solutions uh, that are called strong electrolytes. So we're going to go ahead and get started here today by a little review. First off, solubility is a measure of how much. That means a value in unit. Molarity or molality are great ways to measure how much. How much solute dissolves into a solvent at a set of given conditions, temperature and pressure to form a saturated solution. So there's as much in there as possible at that set of conditions. How much, um, what, what's the concentration at that, uh, at that point? You know, for that solute and for that solvent. Now recall from the lab we had sodium acetate and calcium hydroxide. Both of those solutions were saturated. I couldn't dissolve anymore. However, the concentrations were widely different. Um, calcium hydroxide was, was probably uh, slightly soluble or um, only partially soluble, maybe even insoluble. So very, very small amount of, of those uh, ionic formula units actually broke apart in water, whereas sodium acetate in water um, was very, very soluble. And there were a lot, there was a lot of particles that were able to dissolve in a solution of water. And so when we're looking at solubility, um, what we have to remember is that every solute is unique. So let's talk about um, some factors that affect this, um, the way things that are dissolved. The first thing we're going to talk about is the rate of solvation. In other words, how fast um, something is dissolved. And so some of these things are going to be, we can, we can stir it up. So I want to make some Kool-Aid. If I agitate it as I stir it together, um, it's going to increase the collisions. It's going to make it more likely the solvent is going to latch onto the solute and break it apart um, more quickly. Uh, another thing we can do is we can heat it up. As I heat it up, what we're doing is we're increasing the kinetic energy of those uh, solvent particles. There's more collisions, more, more collisions, they're more forceful. And because of that, they're going to be able to yank off, um, so yank apart solute particles faster, um, more quickly. A third thing we can do is, is if I increase the surface area of the solute, if I throw a giant chunk or a sugar cube in my Kool-Aid, it's going to take longer for me to dissolve um, because there's just not much surface area. There's just not that uh, n not, not that much area where the solvent particles can kind of go and yank off solute particles um, where if I grind it up there's just a lot more surface area and so if I increase the surface area the speed will also will increase as well. Now these are only talking about how fast it dissolves something. Whether I, if I go and throw calcium hydroxide in, into a, a thing um, I can always increase the speed that it dissolves but at the end of the day, there's still not very much that's going to dissolve. So I want to talk about some factors that affect solubility or how much actually dissolves. So the first thing is temperature. Um, if I can increase the temperature, then I can actually, at that higher temperature, at a different set of conditions, I can actually increase the concentration that can be dissolved. So if I wanted to make some really, really sweet Kool-Aid, I could increase the temperature of my Kool-Aid when I, um, I'm about to serve it, and I could probably dissolve a little bit more in there. Um, but then it would be warm Kool-Aid. It probably would be kind of gross. But I could do it if I wanted to. Um, another factor that affects solubility would be um, pressure, and this is only good for gases. Okay, so an example of this is, you know, we have a can of Coca-Cola here, and it tastes really good when I first open it, but if I leave it out for a while, you'll notice that it loses that fizziness, it loses its carbonation. Well, what did we have to do to get it carbonated? Um, we, we had to increase the pressure, and this can was put under pressure, and as the external pressure increased, we were able to force CO2 to go into the liquid phase uh, and dissolve in the water. And so this is only good for gases, but if I increase the pressure um, on a gas, then we can increase the gas's solubility uh, in, in the liquid phase, in uh, liquid solvent. Okay. 
increases the gaseous solubility in the, uh, the, liquid, the liquid solvent. The last thing we can do is we can have a different sol a solvent. Um, so depending upon how those two things pair together, um, they may or may not dissolve very well. I mean, oil and water is a great example. Uh, here's uh, an example of uh, a giant hydrocarbon. This is um, um, a giant, uh, maybe something like an oil where we have these big long carbon chains. This thing is very nonpolar. Um, London dispersion forces my electrons switching around in here are going to be the primary oops, the primary um, intermolecular force. But if I want to dissolve this thing, I would need another um, nonpolar solvent. Um, and so like dissolves like. If I don't have a like solvent, I'm not going to be able to, to yank apart those, uh, those molecules. So remember that polar is going to be able to dissolve or be dissolved by polar molecules, uh, solvent solute combinations, and nonpolar solute or solvents are going to be able to dissolve or to be dissolved in nonpolar, um, other nonpolar things. Okay, so keep that in mind. So I want to talk about our solute a little bit here. Um, every solute is unique depending upon uh, the, the, the makeup. Um, and so there's three basic types of, of solutes that we need to, to know about. The first one is a strong electrolyte. And it's a strong electrolyte, that word electrolyte, if you think back to the, the simulation we did, when you dissolved an ionic compound in water, it would conduct electricity. They were flowing charged pieces. Electrons could jump back and forth between there and, and the thing could allow ele electrons to flow through it. So a strong electrolyte completely dissociates Okay, NaCl, essentially 100% of these guys are going to break apart into my ions. Um, if we go back to our simulation, when I had a table saw and we shake this thing in the water, what you'll notice is basically 100% of those um, ions that go in there are going to dissociate. Okay. Um, and so this is a strong electrolyte. On a solubility table, this would show up all. I'll go ahead and give you some more, um, more stuff you can write on here. Okay, associates 100% into ions. And so um, on a solubility table, this would be reading soluble. Okay, remember this doesn't mean solid. On a solubility table. Okay, soluble on a solubility table, and because it dissociates 100% into ions, it's going to be able to have a very high concentration molarity when it's saturated. So when I go back on my simulation, and I'm going to keep dumping in NaCl, and because it dissociates 100%, um, it's very soluble. By the time it finally gets to that saturation point, when the, when the solution can't hold anymore, there's going to be a lot in there. Um, they are very easy to break apart. Uh, so we call those strong electrolytes. Now, weak electrolytes, um, these are going to show up as uh, slightly soluble or partially soluble. And in fact, even insoluble um, ionic compounds are considered weak electrolytes because all ionic compounds um, will break up to some degree, even if it's very slightly, will dissociate to some degree, even if it's only a little bit. Um, and so this just means that much, much less than 100% are going to dissociate, okay? Uh, much, much less than 100%. And so what this means is, um, by the time my solution gets saturated, and I'll show you this in a second, uh, not a whole lot was able to uh, was able to dissolve. Most stayed together. Okay, so when saturated. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my uh, my simulation here. We'll keep those, uh, and I'm going to go to slightly soluble salts. This is mercury bromide. So I shake it in there, and you'll notice that some of them do break apart, um, but this solution has already become saturated. I can no longer add any more and have it still dissolve. This has a, this got saturated very quickly. I'm just adding more, but it's not doing anything. 
Um, and so when I look at the, uh, the amount of that that's actually dissolved in here, it, it's a low concentration. This is a slightly soluble salt. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about is uh, a non-electrolyte. And so non-electrolyte will not break apart into ions. Um, these are mostly molecular compounds. Um, and so these are just going to be called non-electrolytes. Not only will they not break into ions, but they won't conduct electricity. So that's why we, uh, they're not called electrolytes. All right, so what I want to do is I want to give you an example of a strong electrolyte. and um, an example problem to help you with uh, some of the worksheet. The worksheet. So here's an example. Let's say I have 328.2 grams of calcium nitrate, and uh, calcium is plus two, nitrate is minus one. So I'm just kind of writing the formula here. Okay, calcium nitrate dissolves in uh, 500 milliliters of water. Divide that bad boy by a thousand. Okay, half a liter. And it says find the concentration of each ion present and assume that calcium nitrate is a strong electrolyte. Good, all of it's going to break apart and the solution is still unsaturated. Okay, so all of it will break apart. It's a strong electrolyte. That means that all of this is going to be um, not in this form. It's not going to be together. It's not going to be in a compound. It's going to be broken apart, dissociated into ions. So let's go ahead and take a look at the, this dissoci This is called a dissociation reaction. So I have calcium nitrate, and that's going to be uh, in the solid form. And I throw that into water. Actually, I'm going to put aqueous on here because it says it was uh, AQ. So we throw that into water, and um, it's going to dissociate in water into ions, calcium plus two and nitrate minus one. And I have one calcium and two nitrate ions. And I'm gonna put a little one out front there. Okay, this is called a dissociation reaction. So the, the problem says I want you to find the concentration of each ion. So there's two ions. I wanna find the concentration of each. Okay, so to find concentration, uh, we're going to do uh, molarity. It's going to be our typical way. So uh, I need to remember that I need to find the uh, molarity of this, these ions. So I need moles and I need liters. Now they give me grams of calcium nitrate. Okay, and so in order to find uh, molarity, I'm going to need the number of moles and divide by the total volume. And so before I can get the number of moles, I need to convert from grams to moles. So I'm gonna go ahead and calculate the molar mass. Calcium is 40.1, um, nitrogen is 14.0, and we have two of those. And then we have oxygen. Um, remember, we're gonna distribute that, uh, that two down at the bottom. And so we've got six of those, 16.0 times six. And when I add up those, we're getting 160, um, 169.1, excuse me, 164.1 grams per mole. So the next thing I want to do is I want to convert my, um, I'm going to actually save this in a second. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and convert my grams to moles first off. So 328.2 grams. And to get that to moles, we're going to divide by that molar mass. And we're going to get that there is exactly a nice grid, this is a great number, 2.00 moles. Okay, so I have two moles of calcium nitrate. I throw that into water. Um, I want to find the concentration of that. So molarity is number of moles divided by the total volume. We have 2.00 moles. I'm going to assume now this is uh, this is kind of a um, <laughs> a tough assumption to make. This is a lot of grams of substance. Um, the total volume is likely not to be a half a liter. It's probably going to be more than a half a liter. But for the sake of this problem, I'm going to assume that that um, volume change is going to be negligible or that the total solution is going to be uh, added in a way that I end at 0.5 liters. I should rewrite that question. And then I'm going to go ahead and figure out that it is a one molar solution um, of calcium nitrate. Okay. 
So what I want to do now is now that I know that the concentration um, of this is 1.0 moles per liter, I'm just going to put that underneath there. The question says, well, what about these other guys? So now I want to show you the simulation. And I want us to look at my uh, soluble salt. Okay, so I want you to look at this here. As I let this go, I'm going to put it in play. Actually, let's do this one more time. Maybe there's a shake. All right, as it falls down, you'll notice that um, each one of these Na is attached to a Cl, and they're together. And right now I have nine Na's and nine Cl's. When they break apart into water, you'll notice that I have nine Na atoms and nine Cl atoms together. So I had the exact same number of ions as I had number of formula units. And so when I when I make a much bigger bundle, um, from current slide, what I'm going to find out is that if I have one mole per liter dissolved in my solution of calcium nitrate, that every one of those uh, formula units breaks apart into one calcium ion. So I have a mole per liter of calcium ions. And then because I have every one of those um, breaks into two NO3s, I have two moles per liter dissolved. So I just have twice as many floating around in there. And so my final answers are right there. That's going to be our uh, final molarity for those things there. Okay, because just like I saw in that simulation, when I drop one of those into water and they break apart, um, I can still treat them the exact same way. I just have a bigger bundle. Okay, um, this has been a video that hopefully has been helpful for you to work through um, ion concentration worksheet, and I will see you soon. Have a great day.